tonight heard at least one thing that you hadn't heard before. Picture a warm, sunny Sunday morning, the kind where the world seems to be waking up to a brand new day filled with possibilities. Back when I was a child, I used to wait impatiently for my parents to get up ready for church. My small fingers would fidget with the remote flipping through the channels on our old television set. And there, in the bright living room, bathed in the morning light, is where I first encountered them. The Prosperity Preachers. And you need to make a vow of faith of a thousand dollars. Oh, Bob, couldn't you say 25? No! God will say, enough is enough. It's payback time. I want you to go to the phone or online and sow a seed. Now remember, I'm going to ask you to sow an exceptional and uncommon seed of $1,000. Somebody's son is going to be set free from alcohol because of your $1,000 seed. Tithing is the way for recession or depression to bypass you. I'm speaking prophetically by the Holy Spirit, and you are to sow a $3,000 seed. You know the ones immaculately dressed in sharp suits, their voices smooth and compelling, filling up our living room with the promises of health, wealth, and prosperity, all in exchange for faith and a seed offering. The destiny and the harvest is present in the seed itself. I'm Johan Marais and welcome to the Rock Solid channel, where you get a solid foundation in theology that's built on the Word of God. Even as a child, there was something captivating about these preachers. Their charisma, the glimmering auditoriums, the adoring audience hanging on to every word. It was theatrical, larger than life, and undeniably compelling. They offered a version of Christianity that seemed so alluring, a God who acted like a celestial investment banker. But as I grew older and began to study the Bible more earnestly, I found myself increasingly conflicted. The teachings of these preachers didn't seem to align with the gospel I was reading in my Bible. And the more I delved into the scripture, the more I began to question the validity of the prosperity gospel and its theology. It all began in the late 19th century with the New Thought Movement. The New Thought Movement is an umbrella term that encompasses a variety of beliefs centered on the idea that positive thinking can lead to positive results in the physical world. The movement was influenced by a diverse range of philosophies and religious traditions, including Christianity, Eastern religions, the Bergioning field of psychology, as well as contemporary movements of spiritualism and mesmerism, all mixed together. The key tenets of the New Thought movement included the belief in a universal spiritual presence, or energy, the power of the mind to affect reality, and the idea that positive thinking can bring about healing or success. Out of this movement, some key institutions were found, like the International Divine Science Association, the Unity Church, and the Church of Religious Science. But it wasn't until the mid-20th century, however, that what we now recognize as the prosperity gospel began to take shape. The figure who is often attributed as the father of the movement is Oral Roberts, an American Pentecostal televangelist. Roberts was one of the first to effectively use the television as a medium to reach a larger audience in the 1950s and 60s. He introduced the concept of seed faith which suggested that donations given in faith, the seeds, would multiply and return to the giver in forms of personal blessings and prosperity. This teaching laid the groundwork for the Give to Get doctrine. In the 1970s and 80s, the prosperity gospel began to gain significant traction. The period saw the rise of televangelists like Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, and later Joel Olstein who would become synonymous with the prosperity gospel movement. The 1980s, in particular, were a golden era for televangelism and the prosperity gospel. 
as preachers like Jim and Tammy Faye Becker and Jimmy Swaggett reached millions of homes with their Praise the Lord network and other television programs, prosperity gospel teachings became further ingrained in the American religious culture. Despite significant scandals involving these televangelists, such as Packer's PTL Club scandal and sexual misconduct in 1987, and Swaggart's sexual scandal that caused his fall from grace in 1988, the prosperity gospel persisted. Instead of leading to its decline, these events seem to have merely caused a shift in leadership and strategy. In the 1990s and 2000s, megachurch pastors like Joel Osteen and Creflo Dollar took up the mantle. Osteen, who became the pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston in 1999 following his father's death, has been particularly influential in shaping the modern prosperity gospel movement. His best-selling books and pack stadiums have further popularized the message that God desires to bless his followers with wealth and success. It's important to note, however, that while the prosperity gospel has found fertile ground in the United States, it's not an exclusively American phenomenon. The movement has made significant inroads into countries in Africa, Latin America and Asia. For instance, David Oyedepo, founder of the Nigerian megachurch Faith Tabernacle, has been a major proponent of the prosperity gospel in Africa since the 1980s and has a net worth of several hundred million dollars, own multiple private jets and live in a luxurious mansion. There has however been some pushback from the mainstream Christian church. In 2010, a significant Christian gathering known as the Third Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization was held in Cape Town, South Africa. This Congress brought together 4,200 evangelical leaders from 198 countries and is representative of the global church. During the Congress, the prosperity gospel was explicitly criticized. The participants affirmed a statement called the Cape Town Commitment, which reads in part, We reject the prosperity gospel that material wealth is a sure sign of God's blessing. The prosperity gospel offers no lasting solution to poverty and can divert people from the real treasures of Christ. This unequivocal rejection by such a broad spectrum of evangelical leaders serves as a powerful rebuttal to the prosperity gospel. When we take a closer look at the teachings of the prosperity gospel, there are five central pillars that this theology rests on. Wealth, faith, speech, sowing and health. So let's have a quick look at each of these pillars. God desires material wealth for all his followers. Central to the prosperity gospel is the belief that material wealth is a sign of God's favor. Prosperity preachers will promote the idea that God intends for all his followers to thrive materially. And for believers in this doctrine, financial success and blessings are a direct indicator of one's faithfulness and alignment with God's will. Faith is a self-generated spiritual force that leads to prosperity. The prosperity gospel places enormous emphasis on the personal faith as the driving force behind material success. According to this view, unwavering faith and positive confession can manifest desires into reality. Positive speech yields positive results. Words have power. This pillar of the prosperity gospel is rooted in a belief that spoken affirmations and declarations can alter one's reality. Giving leads to financial compensation. Generosity, according to the prosperity gospel, isn't merely a virtue, but an investment strategy. Financial giving, especially to the ministries, guarantees material blessings in return. The more one gives, the more one supposedly receives. God wants all to be physically healthy. Just as material wealth is seen as a sign of God's divine favor, 
so too is physical health. The idea is that divine healing is guaranteed for all believers in the present age. While many Christians acknowledge the power of divine healing, the prosperity gospel implies a lack of faith or misalignment with God's will if a person is not healed. The prosperity gospel offers a perspective on God's blessings that resonates with many, particularly in an age of materialism. It's a gospel that is centered on me. It's all about my needs and how my physical desires can be met. God is placed in a box with promises. It's like a genie in a lamp. If I rub the lamp in the right way and say the right words, then a genie will fulfill all my wishes. So God is placed in a box for my needs to serve me and fulfill my desires. But what does the Bible actually teach? In John 16 verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The promise is not of an easy or trouble-free life, but of peace amidst the inevitable storms of life, sourced from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Another important statement of Jesus is found in Matthew 11 verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here, Jesus is inviting those who are struggling under life's burdens to find rest and peace in Him, emphasizing the importance of spiritual rest over material prosperity. The Apostle Paul, a major New Testament figure, also writes powerfully about the transcendent nature of the Christian life. In Philippians 4 verse 11 to 13, he states, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Paul's writings and Jesus' teachings clearly covers this central point. The Christian life is not about amassing wealth or achieving worldly success. Rather, it's about experiencing God's peace and joy in every circumstance. And believe me when I tell you, as a Christian, there will be challenging times. When we look at every disciple, the leaders of the first church, and every great man of God that has ever lived, they've gone through hardships, persecutions, challenges, and many of them even lost their lives for the gospel's sake knowing that the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Is the gospel you believe in only focused on worldly prosperity? Or is it grounded in the teachings of Jesus Christ, centered on God's will, spiritual growth, love and sacrifice? Remember that Christianity is not a ticket to earthly wealth or a shield from suffering. Instead, it's about spiritual growth, love, humility, service, and ultimately glorifying God and not ourselves. As Christians, we don't find our faith in our possessions or earthly wealth and health, but rather we live a life of faith, trusting in Jesus Christ and His goodness, despite our surroundings or how things may look like. Because we know that this life is not the end, but we are waiting on Jesus' return, where His kingdom will be established in a new age to come. As 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 to 19 tells us, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life 
that is truly life. Does God answer prayers? Yes, He does. Can God take care of your needs? Of course He can. Can God heal you? Yes, He can. But does it all happen according to the way you want it to? No, not always. And that is sometimes hard to accept. But even if it doesn't happen the way you want it to be, are you still willing to surrender to God's will? Are you still willing to die to yourself and your desires and allow God's will to manifest in your life, no matter what that means? In Luke 9 verse 24, Jesus said, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. As Christians, we are called to a life of sacrifice, where we lay down our lives. So by laying down your life, you receive the true everlasting life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. A life of purpose and meaning in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth and the life. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any other questions or ideas you want to share, please write them in the comment section below. I would love to make a response video and assist you and everyone else who might have the same questions. Be sure to check out this channel for more content. And if you would like to receive updates on new videos, you can click the like and the subscribe button. I'm Johan Marais. This is the Rock Solid channel. God bless.